Sonic, the heart of your system. So we are back with the AMD Mini ITX system or the Radeon 7 Mini ITX system, which is not a Radeon 7 system anymore because I had to remove the Radeon 7 for now. As you can see, I had to replace it with a Radeon RX 580 for now because I have to use the Radeon 7 for a different project for now. So I had to replace it with the RX 580. A lot of people mentioned in the previous video that it would be possible to switch the GPU holder or the GPU holding bracket of this case so you can flip around the GPU. So I tried that with the RX 580, but then I figured out that the card is just way too close to the window of the case and therefore the airflow to the card is really not good. The temperatures were pretty bad or the fans were spinning up really, really high. So I ended up rotating it back. So as you can see, the bottom fan has very good airflow of this card now. And even the top two fans have quite good airflow. So there's a space of, I would say, 1 to 1.5 centimeters between the mainboard and the card. So the card and the airflow and the ventilation, the card can breathe. So that's totally fine. I would really recommend to mount the card in this direction, even though it doesn't look as nice if you look from the backside, which you cannot see for now, but the system in the end will just be visual from this side so I think it's fine and as I said before um, performance and temperature would be the priority over visuals for me so that's why I ended up mounting the card again in this direction. So in today's topic I would also like to address a topic that I just read way too often on my channel. I often read this um, oh my god you're Intel biased and you just do so much Intel content why do you not do any AMD Ryzen content why is there no AMD Ryzen overclocking and it's not like I don't like AMD Ryzen CPUs. I mean, you can find a ton of AMD Ryzen Threadripper content on my channel. The only problem is that there is not so much you can do with AMD Ryzen when it comes to overclocking. That's also something I want to show you in this video. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to overclock those CPUs. If you compare it, for, ex for example, with an 8700K, there's just so much more you can do. So you can delete the CPU, you can save thermals because obviously thermal paste is crap. You replace it with liquid metal, you have more thermal headroom, then you can overclock your CPU by, I don't know, 400, 500 megahertz, which is something that's simply not possible on those AMD Ryzen CPUs. So that's the reason why I don't have any overclocking um, topics around those CPUs because there is, in my opinion, not much you can do. So before we go even deeper into that, we will just go over the software quickly, which is related to the system. So um, obviously the first thing I did was installing all the drivers and everything and then I also in installed all the software we need for the RGB stuff, which is obviously important. So for ballistics by Micron, the memory sticks, we need the mod software, the memory over overview display which is actually quite quite nice, better than I expected. So we can read out the SPD info if you want to see your timings in detail. Also, what's very interesting, you can see the temperature of your modules. So that's quite nice. You can see modules are at like 35 degrees Celsius. So that's really, really cold. Everything, anything below 60 or 70 degrees is absolutely no problem for memory modules. So that's totally fine. If we go to LED control, obviously, you can set whatever setting you want. I set everything to red, simply to match the color theme. So I just put it to, um, to static and then to red. Same goes for Aura. So the Asus software for the RGB control, you can see mainboard, LED strip and the water cooler are linked together. So everything is just put to red and static as well. Obviously, you can put rainbow or whatever you prefer in here. Also, one thing I would like to show you what is kind of a cool feature I think. So that's the live dash software which is required to um, correctly set your AIO cooler. So opening the live dash software you can click on AIO cooler on the top and then you can, which is my favorite, select what kind of uh, information you want to display on the OLED which is really cool. So as you can see I displayed the CPU temperature but you can also switch it to a CPU voltage or whatever you want. So there's a ton of settings, a ton of adjustments you can do. That's a really cool feature. I really like it and I think it's the only AIO that has this kind of feature. So there's a lot you can play around with. You can set your own logo or whatever. Just spend your time on this software. It's quite, quite nice. But let's get back to the Ryzen 5 2600X. So I just opened Cinebench R20, which is now the new Cinebench version, which I tend to use now. It just takes a lot longer than R15, which I don't like that much, but I think that's mainly because we're using a CPU with less cores. So six cores these days is less, right? Because if we're using 28 cores, then this is probably a more accurate benchmark than R15. What I want to show you is that the CPU is now boosting at 3.964G, uh, something in this direction. 
um, highest I saw multi-core um, boost was like 4025 with my CPU. And if we run the single threaded benchmark and check the clock, you can see the single threaded speed boosts to like 4150 on a good day. It also boosts sometimes to 4175, which is really solid. And that's what you need for gaming performance, obviously. So single threaded performance for gaming is really, really important. And now the problem is overclocking the CPU on all cores. If you would overclock the CPU in all cores, the maximum I can do on my CPU is 4150 megahertz. I cannot really go higher because if I go higher, I really need a very, very high voltage above 1.5 volt. And in my opinion, it doesn't really make sense to use such a high voltage because if we just compare those values. So stock CPU is running with 1.37 V core. Temperature max is 64 degrees Celsius across all cores in Cinebench Multi, which results in a power consumption of 115 Watt over the whole CPU. Single threaded performance, obviously same V core. We have a maximum core temperature of 53 degrees Celsius and the power consumption is 32 Watt. The score is 3046 points stock for multi and 425 points for single threaded performance. So now the goal is obviously to match the single threaded performance if we want to do overclocking because if we push the performance across all the cores, we still don't want to lose gaming performance, right? Which is essentially what we would use this system for. So obviously we, we don't want to lose gaming performance. So our goal would be to have at least 4,150 megahertz, 4,175 megahertz, which is what the CPU boosts to at stock. And that's what we can do. But if we push the CPU to 4,150 megahertz across all cores, it results in 3,145 points in Cinebench R20, which is an increase of 3.2%, but power consumption increased to 158 watt, which is an increase of 27%. So the trade-off is to have the same single threaded performance again, we have to increase the multi threaded performance really, really high, which gives us additional 3.2%, which is nothing you will probably notice anywhere. And we have to live with 27% more power consumption, which is, I think, yeah, too much. So 27% more power consumption for 3% more performance. I think you would agree that it doesn't really make much sense. You would leave the CPU on stock. And what I actually ended up with is undervolting the CPU. So I undervolted the CPU by 40 millivolt, which then allowed me to save additional 8 to 10 watt, which in my opinion is even better. So you lose, uh, so you lower the CPU temperature, power consumption, boost stays the same, performance stays the same. But overall, I think uh, that's the better choice. So this is what my system looks like for now. So I enabled DOCP, which is uh, 3000 megahertz. Obviously I could try to overclock the memory as well. Probably 3200 is not really an issue. As I said before, what you can try are those options. So the performance enhancer, we have four levels, level one and two are AMD based options and level three and four are enhancing the XFR based on Asus experience and the sealed experience. So it will overclock your CPU with XFR. As I said before, I tried it with my CPU. It pushed it to uh, 4225 megahertz, which didn't work. It just was not stable even with 1.15 uh, 1.55 volt and that's really the limit. I would not go higher. Even that for 24 seven is too much for my taste. So I ended up just under vaulting the CPU. So I used offset mode and lowered the V core by uh, 43 millivolt, which worked totally fine for me. I even 70 millivolt worked fine for Cinebench, but it was not stable for Prime 95. So that's why I ended up using 43 millivolt negative offset just to lower the power consumption a little bit, lower the temperature of the CPU a little bit. It's only like 10 watt what you save with this kind of offset, like eight to 10 watt, it's not too much, but yeah, I think it's worth to try what you can get out of your CPU with an offset. Just let me know what you think about Ryzen topics in general. As I said before, I would really be happy to provide more like Ryzen overclocking topics, tutorials or whatever. But in my opinion, it really does not make much sense to overclock those CPUs. So it's not like I don't want to provide the content to you. It's not li like I don't like AMD Ryzen CPUs, but there's nothing I can do with them overclocking wise because XFR is just working perfectly fine the way it is. So. Yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. So just leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think about this whole Ryzen topic and see you next time.